Thank you for joining us on Idaho State of Mind, where we endeavor to educate the citizens of Idaho on the state of higher education. I'm Libby Howe. This is a production of Idaho State University, and we are proud that the majority of the show's content is created by ISU Mass Communication students. Parents are always watching for signs their children are developing properly, from crawling to eyesight, social skills to behavior. Coming up later in the show, we'll take a look at speech development. Certainly, every child develops at its own pace, but when should you start to worry? We'll be talking to speech experts about milestones and signs that your child may be behind. We'll also look at things you can do to help your child get back up to speed. But first, in a sagging economy, many people are trying to figure out where to go from here. Topping our show today, we're looking at people in career transition. Whether you are a newly single mom with few job skills, laid off from a career, or someone who needs to further your education to enhance your skills, we'll have tips on how to navigate life's career transitions. It can be scary to be thrust into an unexpected career transition. Where do you start and is there any place to turn for help? Luckily, resources are available in Centers for New Directions located across the state of Idaho. Idaho State of Mind's Deanne Coffin joins us live in the studio with more. Deanne, where can people turn for help? Libby, it takes a great leap of faith, and that is exactly what the Center for New Directions motto is. The mission of the Center for New Directions is to assist individuals in transition to become personally and economically self-sufficient. Whether you are interested in choosing a career, entering school, updating skills, obtaining employment, or looking to become self-sufficient. Carmen is a great example of someone that took that great leap of faith and headed to the Center for New Directions to get guidance. Being a, a full-time single mom, I had to find something that paid more than minimum wage. So I decided to come back to school, uh, which led me to the Center for New Directions. Carmen was faced with everyday life challenges that pushed her towards making that decision to move on and begin a new future for herself. I am a recovering alcoholic, um, and with my daughter being in and out of jail for drug usage, it was really starting to wear on my own recovery. Due to Carmen's everyday struggles, she was able to take advantage of the mental health counseling that the center offers the students and the community. They actually got me set up with a new counselor um, who shares my background in, in whether it be alcoholism, um, child abuse, um, they have dealt with that. I do a lot of queer counseling, helping them um, community members, for instance, helping them trying to look into a career. Uh, the College of Technology students often come up and think that maybe they want to change careers or that they have barriers that they are struggling with, so then I end up doing a lot of mental health counseling. I can go in there and invent um, whether I'm struggling in a certain class, I have an issue with an instructor, I'm having an issue in a marriage, or at home with kids um, or just life in general. Um. At the Center for New Directions she was able to get information and help from people that cared and could get her back on track. The Center for New Directions sat down with Carmen and helped her to set a goal and map out her life and then give her the tools to help her succeed. Um, well they offer the the career counseling uh, which is very beneficial, especially if they're an undecided major. They can come in for the career counseling or the personal mental health counseling or educational information. Where are the scholarships? How to fill out the scholarship? How to apply for financial aid? And, and any question that they may have that they don't know where to go. Despite all of Carmen's struggles, she was able to pull herself up and begin making positive changes in her life. Carmen is now a full-time student at ISU and she has two jobs, one of which she is a tutor for Center for New Directions where she is helping other students with their academic struggles. Besides career counseling and personal counseling, the center offers scholarships and single parent student support. So this, we're a great resource for students and also community members. The Center for New Directions served 716 individuals between July 2010 and June 2011, and the total number of appointments during this year was 2,034. The Center has also seen an increase in the number of men and single parent students accessing services. The best part about it is that it is free. Libby? 
Thanks, Deanne. And joining us today is Chris Brower. She's the director for the ISU Center for New Directions. She joins us with some helpful information about navigating a career transition. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. This is a very relevant topic right now. There are a lot of people in transition with the economy the way it is. What would you suggest people do when they find themselves in an unexpected career transition? They can contact one of the Centers for New Directions in Idaho. There are six of them, and we'll have information about their locations for individuals. And they can get career guidance, career exploration, career counseling, as well as personal counseling at the Centers for New Directions. Let's talk about some of those locations <coughs> all over the state. There are six Centers for New Directions in Idaho, and they're located in at Idaho's technical colleges at here, Idaho State University, Eastern Idaho Technical College, College of Southern Idaho, College of Western Idaho, North Idaho College, and Lewis Clark State College. So really, I mean, they're, they're spread out well across the state, whether you live in Southern Idaho, Northern Idaho, yes. um, there, there's options for everybody, and that's good to know. If someone finds themselves in a transition, I think a big thing would be taking care of themselves. Let's talk a little bit about some of those tips to kind of keep you centered as you're looking for that next opportunity. Exactly. Um, taking care of yourself is a very important um, thing to do. Getting enough rest, <clears throat> eating well, um, finding supportive friends, a supportive environment where you feel encouraged to carry on with what's facing, what you're facing. Um, also asking for help and that can be asking for counseling and um, a person can get referrals to counseling in a couple of ways. One is there are counseling agencies in each community and also asking for referrals from say your um, high school counselor or um, your church counselor. So you can find counseling that's um, available at a low cost or based on a sliding fee scale. So a lot of that just has to do with the stress, I would think, of being out of work. So that makes a big difference. I know you have a lot of people who come into your offices who for lack of a better word are misplaced homemakers, whether it's due to death of a spouse or a divorce. One of the things that you suggest to them are non-traditional careers. Let's talk about that. Why non-traditional careers for women? Actually, a non-traditional career is an occupation in which 25% of the workforce or less is of your gender. So there are non-traditional occupations for women and for men also. Mm -hmm. And so we encourage individuals um, to, to look to check those out and see if they might fit into one because the wages are generally higher than average. There's a benefits package often. There's a career ladder. There's a job satisfaction too of doing work that you want to do. And um, individuals can explore those non-trad occupations and the training programs mm -hmm. at the Centers for New Directions or at a community college near them or a university. What would be an example of a non-traditional <coughs> career? Well, currently women in electronics or in the energy industry mm -hmm. certainly um, that's non-trad for women and there those occupations are in high demand so people want to check those out mm -hmm. and then for men many occupations in the health field mm -hmm. are non-trad for men and the demand is high for those jobs too and thank you for joining us now, the center also hosts the annual Women and Work Conference each year. The conference helps high school girls and adult women explore occupations in science, technology, engineering, math, and the trades. These occupations often offer higher wages, benefits, and promotions. Often, people in career transitions turn to higher education to help gain or hone their qualifications. Those in transition need to make long-term goals. A system called backward career decision-making can help make the process much easier. It's as simple as using your imagination. Imagine your ideal future. Where are you living? What is your income? What type of lifestyle are you living? Now work backwards. How do you make this future happen? First, you need to find a career that matches this future. If you prefer to work outdoors, for example, you would need to identify careers that make that lifestyle possible. Next, find degrees that fit that career.
As the state designated provider of health professions education, Idaho State University brings us Healthy State of Mind, a segment dedicated to all things health related. Have you ever worried that your toddler wasn't keeping up with its developmental milestones? At one time or another, every parent wonders if they should be worried. Idaho State of Mind's Summer Geoc introduces us to one mother concerned her daughter's speech development is delayed. Marcy Miller allowed us an inside look into her daughter's speech evaluation. Take a look. Okay. McKinley so Miller is this. a sweet, okay. fun, and active three-year-old little girl, but you can only understand a portion of what she's saying. McKinley is having trouble sounding out her M and W words. Her mom says she just isn't sure that her speech is where it's supposed to be. I noticed that kind of when she was two that she was a little bit behind more than like her, her, her cousins that are the same age. Marcy also says that it can be frustrating for McKinley when she is trying to ask for something and no one can understand. I think probably the babysitter, like the first day she watched her, she's like, uh, I'm really having a hard time understanding anything she's saying. She's getting really frustrated. Um, you might want to think about it before she goes to kindergarten because she's going to be frustrated in school if she's not being understood. Since Marcy works That's near it. the ISU Speech and Hearing Clinic, okay. she thought she might as well have McKinley get an evaluation. The evaluation takes about two hours. The first okay, step is interviewing the parent. They ask questions about what sounds does she have trouble with, how many words does she speak in a sentence, interaction involving other children, certain problem words or commands, and other questions just involving everyday life and speech. Here in the observation room, parents can sit and watch their children get their evaluations. Meanwhile, McKinley is next door getting her interview done by two graduate speech students. They have her name what's on pictures, do certain facial expressions, play with the doll, and basically just talk and interact with her while observing and taking notes. The evaluation also includes a hearing test. Yeah, I think it's definitely beneficial, especially for parents to kind of, you know, if they're really worried about something and they bring a child in and we're like, no, they're fine. You know, I think that's a big kind of burden taken off the parents or to find like, you know what, they could use a little extra help and the earlier you get them in, the better and the easier it is for them. After the evaluation, the clinic provides a recommendation for McKinley's family. At the Speech and Hearing Clinic, Summer Geoc, Idaho State of Mind. You should be able to understand about 25% of what a one-year-old says. By age two, about 50% of what they say should be understood. When a child reaches four, even a stranger should be able to understand 100% of what that child says. Joining us today with additional insight into speech development is Sarah Knudsen. She is the director of ISU Speech Language and uh, Pathology Clinic. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Now, I think the natural thing for any parent is to compare your child with what other children their age are doing. But that can be a little dangerous because there's actually quite a wide range of what, stu uh, what is normal, I guess. Can you talk about some of the milestones that parents should be looking for? You bet. You know, when you're looking at a toddler, typically we expect first words to happen right around 12 months of age. Mm -hmm. However, the range of normal is between 9 months and 18 months. So some children are born talking a lot and talking early, and others are a little later, but still within that normal developmental range. Okay, I've seen that with my own children. So what about when they get to be about a year? What should we be seeing? By the time a child is about a year old, we should be seeing them use one-word sentences. Mm -hmm. Cookie, more, mama, words like mm -hmm. that. By the time a child reaches two years of age, we expect that they will be using two words mm -hmm. per sentence. Bye-bye, daddy, kitty, gone, things like that. At the age of three, we expect three words per sentence, and this rule holds true through the age of five, where they should be using about five words per sentence. Okay, so at what point should a parent be worried? Well, a parent should be concerned if a child is not reaching those, mm -hmm. uh, one year of age, one word. Those are kind of the lower level of normal, mm -hmm. uh, so parents should seek some information if they have a child who has not yet met those criteria. If your child hasn't met those criteria, they're not really talking at all, can they still be evaluated? They can. There are a lot of precursors to communication. Some of that is eye gaze, some of that is reaching and pointing, 
There are gestures, body language, and we can look at the communicative intent behind all of those gestures to determine whether or not a child is functioning appropriately for their age. I've, I've seen it with my own two-year-old. He's not much of a talker, but he sure can communicate yeah. with us. So there's definitely communication that goes on that's not verbal. Are there things that parents can do in their home to try to encourage and help verbal communication? You know, for young children, one of the most important times of the day, or any day, any day, are those routines. Bath time, diaper changing time, meal time. These times, the children know what's going to happen, and they're able to relax a little bit and build vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So, And also making the child do something verbal to get a treat if they want milk, even mm -hmm. if they just say, mm, oh, good talking, here's the milk. Okay. Go ahead and reinforce them for any attempt they make at communication. So it doesn't have to be perfect, just as long as they are playing along and they're trying. Right, as long as they are trying, that is a good thing. We want to really encourage and reinforce any communication that they, they attempt. Excellent. Um, are there common reasons for why there, some children are delayed in speech? You know, some children have an additional diagnosis mm -hmm. of Down syndrome or mental retardation. In those cases, we generally know mm -hmm. why they have a speech and language delay. But for typically developing kids, we really don't know what causes speech and language delays. Mm -hmm. It's not something that parents do or don't do. Mm -hmm. That's um, probably something that makes people feel a little better. <laughs> and a lot of people feel a lot of guilt about uh -huh. that. But really, we don't know the root of those problems for most kids. But it is treatable. Okay. Are there common treatments? There are common treatments. Typically, uh, you'll be involved with a speech therapist, uh, sometimes in the home, sometimes in a private setting. Um, and it's a lot of practice and working and helping the parents understand what to look for and what to reinforce. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. You have some really important information to share. Thank you. In 2007, more than 2,000 backpack-related injuries were treated at hospital emergency rooms and doctor offices across America. What's a backpack injury, you may be asking? Lisa Santos has the story. In America, more than 79 million students carry a backpack. About 55% of those 79 million students are carrying their backpacks too heavy. I found that the average student at ISU carries a backpack that weighs about five pounds over the suggested backpack weight for their specific body weight. Many of them had experienced back pain as a result of this. I had a sore back, short, sore shoulders, it was uncomfortable. To avoid injury, it's recommended that a loaded backpack should never weigh more than 15% of a student's total body weight. To find out the maximum weight your backpack should be, take your total body weight and multiply it by 15%. So if a person weighs 100 pounds, their backpack should never weigh over 15 pounds. I know when I was a student that sometimes I had to have a backpack so heavy it would break blood vessels and give me bruising on my shoulders. Is your backpack hurting your shoulders? It might be. Tight, narrow straps that dig into your shoulders can pinch nerves and interfere with circulation, <laughs> causing tingling, numbness and weakness in your arms and hands. If you have to struggle to get your backpack on or off, have to lean forward to carry it, or if you have any back pain, then the way you are using your backpack or its weight may need to be adjusted. Your spine is made of 33 bones called vertebrae, and between the vertebrae are discs that act as natural shock absorbers. When you incorrectly place a heavy weight on your shoulders, the weight force can either pull you backward or forward, causing you to lean either way at the hips. Leaning can cause your shoulders to become rounded and the upper back curved inward or outward. That can uh, really cause problems that can affect you for the rest of your life. Because you carry backpacks so much, just even a little bit of uh, injury from it creates what we call a repetitive motion injury. So that means over and over and over again you're injuring things. And, some major problems. Carrying a heavy backpack changes a person's posture and the way they walk, increasing their risk of falling, particularly on stairs or other places where a backpack puts the wearer off balance. Before you grab that new backpack off the shelf, there's a few things you want to check for. Make sure it has padding to reduce pressure on the shoulder area, hip and chest belts to transfer some of the backpack weight to the hips and torso, multiple compartments to better distribute backpack weight, and lastly, compression straps on the sides and bottom of the backpack for stabilization. Buy yourself a good backpack that doesn't rip like this one. <laughs> Lisa Santos, Rendezvous Complex, Idaho State of Mind.
A little tip for you, packing your heaviest books closest to your back can also help stabilize your backpack just a little bit more. Idaho's big draw for out-of-staters can be summed up quite simply, the great outdoors. One of the Gem State's greatest assets, its huge variety of outdoor opportunities. Today we're taking a look at how Idaho State University is helping students and community members take advantage of that Idaho Gem through its Outdoor Adventure Center. Idaho State of Mind's Ramon Bailey introduces us to one young man who followed the call of the wild to ISU. It's cold. You can see your breath. Your teeth are chattering and you're holding on for your life. On this mountain, Andrew's having the time of his life. Andrew Perry has been an active climber for the last four years. Andrew came to Idaho from Philadelphia after researching outdoor activities and found ISU's Outdoor Adventure Center website. It's a great location for a bunch of activities between anything from skiing, backpacking to climbing and uh, mountain biking. The Outdoor Adventure Center offers numerous activities and trips to ISU students and faculty. But most of our trips are designed for beginners that don't have experience and would like some instruction or some help. They also that, that need some equipment and some support and we offer all of that here at the, the Outdoor Adventure Center. Andrew is an avid outdoorsman and both a member and teacher at the Outdoor Adventure Center. His goal is to have a job in outdoor education and the Outdoor Adventure Center has given him the steps towards doing so. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to uh, learn new skills and develop techniques and being able at the same time not only learning it but also teaching it under others and uh, teaching them what they can do that they never thought they could or putting them in environments where you know, they have to think a little different than they would in a lab. From the Outdoor Adventure Center, I'm Ramon Bailey, Idaho State of Mind. The Outdoor Adventure Center is located in ISU's Pond Student Union building. Living in Idaho gives us all the opportunity to explore the outdoors, but not everyone, especially students, can justify the purchase of high-priced outdoor equipment. ISU's Outdoor Adventure Rental Program is around to help. Rentals are available to students as well as community members. Rental equipment ranges from kayaks and life jackets, camping supplies such as tents, mattresses and lanterns, and even skiing and winter equipment. They also help repair worn and damaged equipment. The Outdoor Adventure Rental Center is open year round. Participation in outdoor activities can seem impossible for people with disabilities. In 1981, the Cooperative Wilderness Handicapped Outdoor Group, otherwise known as CW Hog, was formed. It opens up the world of outdoor possibilities to people living with a disability. Idaho State of Mind's Chris Cole went to find out more about CW Hog. Team building, confidence, and decision making. These are just some of the team-oriented exercises that CW Hog participants are focusing on. We help folks uh, work on their communication and their leadership skills, um, help, help teams develop better teamwork skills. CW Hog goals include providing challenging outdoor activities, establishing a supportive social network, furthering ties and educating the community, all in regards to people with disabilities. These activities include water sports like rafting or kayaking, taking advantage of the long winters of Idaho with skiing or snowboarding, or even just simple hikes in the many wilderness areas around Pocatello. Uh, my mission for the program really is to, uh, you know, work to, to change people's attitudes to more of a can-do attitude as opposed to I can't. Um, that's my least favorite phrase is can't. Um, people can if they try. All the volunteers and participants work with each other to plan their trips and fundraisers. Not only do they work with each other, they get to know each other on an individual level. Some people that, you know, before I got in, involved with this, I would have, you know, never really given them the time of day. I, w I was one of those people that didn't really understand that, you know, somebody with a disability is just, you know, they're, they're just like me. They're just different. You know, some people are tall, some people are short, some people have blonde hair, some people are in wheelchairs. At the Outdoor Adventure Center Challenge Course, Chris Cole, Idaho State of Mind. 
CW Hog also offers several adaptive classes through the ISU Sports Science and Physical Education Department. Students receive personal lessons from trained instructors for skiing, snowboarding, and other sports. One of the many outdoor recreational classes offered at ISU is a Dutch oven cooking course, which teaches students how to make full course meals outdoors. Meals range from almost anything, such as roast, enchiladas, and even chocolate cake. Dutch ovens typically are made of cast iron and cook around burning coals. Each week, the class gathers outside to make meals, which usually takes at least an hour to finish. The eight-week-long course fills up pretty quickly with around 50 students a semester. Coming up on another episode of Idaho State of Mind, the climate and how it is changing has been headlines for the past couple of decades. But what is the real hard science behind what is happening with our planet? From studies of microorganisms on ice to prescribed fires in forests and even tracking river flows through tagging rocks, Idaho State University in conjunction with BSU and the U of I is taking climate research to the next level. Join us as we explore the latest in climate change research. And that is all for this episode. Thank you for joining us. From the campus of Idaho State University, I'm Libby Howe. We'll see you next time.